All right, Scott Carlson of Repulsion. Welcome to 69 Face of Rock. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Um, one of the reasons for this interview is that you are about to play Chicago as a part of Heavy Chicago Festival. Um, how did this come about? Uh, old friend, um, Sean Duffy. And um, another old friend, Dave Horniak, who are um, organizing the festival, uh, just got in touch with me. And uh, of course, I wanted to come back to Chicago and see all of my friends there. And um, uh, Matt, um, Matt Olivo, our guitarist, uh, his family, him and his wife have a family in Chicago area as well. So it would just seem like a cool little family affair. And we haven't played all that. We weren't planning on playing this year at all. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we had to, you know, sort of like shuffle things around to make it happen. But because it was Chicago, um, we made room for it. It's our only gig of the whole year. Uh, this will be your first Midwest show like in 30 years. What are you yeah. looking for? What was that? What are you looking forward to? After oh, uh, man, for, you know, first of all, just seeing um, all the people in Chicago and the Midwest. Um, I'm sure we have some friends from Michigan coming out. Um, it's always exciting to play in Chicago. It's just a cool, heavy, you know, heavy music hub and um, so many great bands and people from there. But, uh, you know, it's one of our, one of my favorite cities on the whole planet. So I just can't wait to get back there. Can't wait to see you again. Let's talk some history. How did you first get interested in music? Uh, when I was a little kid, my dad was really into the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and the Kinks and the Yardbirds, all that British invasion stuff. So that music was around our house all the time. So I just, um, you know, I was always being exposed to, to that stuff. And um, Jimi Hendrix even. And, and then... Um, Around like 73, my dad brought home this compilation. It was like a Warner music special product. I still have it, actually. It's called Heavy Metal. There aren't too many heavy metal bands on it, but I loved the logo and the words heavy metal. And uh, it was my first exposure to like MC5, uh, Kick Out the Jams was on there. T-Rex, uh, Get It On was on there, Bang and Gong. Golden Earring. It had a couple of other like heavy uh, Black Sabbath, Iron Man, and I, there was a Deep Purple song on it. So uh, that stuff like really piqued my interest in in heavier music. Uh, and I so I got really into like Sabbath and Deep Purple, and then of course uh, that led to uh, you know Kiss. I got into Kiss, and that sort of changed everything. When I got into Kiss, was when I was like, okay, I need a I need a guitar now. <laughs> and speaking of that, when did you first meet Matt Olivo? Uh, probably in those kids. It was definitely in those kiss days. Like we were in various Cub Scout troops together. I think at one time my, or his dad was like the leader, like the, whatever they call it, the Cub, the den, den leader or something like that. So we would have the meetings at his dad's house. Um, so, um, you know, we, we knew each other then, but we didn't really start hanging out until we were in um, like middle school. And uh, I transferred to the middle school that he was at and we ran into each other outside and we were talking on the bus. And um, we we uh, I brought him back to my house and I was like, all right, cool, man. You know, like, uh, let me show you some cool music, you know, because I knew you liked Kiss when we were kids. So I played him some Judas Priest and I pulled out my guitar and I was like playing along to like, you know, living after midnight and breaking the law and stuff like that. And I was like, dude, why don't you get a guitar, man? You know, and you could be my rhythm guitar player. We'll start a band, blah, blah, blah. So he buys a guitar and I make him a tape that's got like a bunch of Sabbath and Priest music on it. And like two weeks later, he comes over and he's like playing circles around me. So I was like, hmm, maybe I better buy a bass. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually that became your first band tempter tell me about that uh yeah well you know we named ourselves after the great chicago band troubles song uh tempter and also from the movie that uh you know used to see on the vhs racks all the time called the tempter which is actually uh 
in in Italy. It's called Antichristo. It's uh, Al, Alberto Di Martino film, I believe, and uh, it's a it's a possession film, sort of an Exorcist ripoff. So that box artwork and um, and the song Tempter by by Trouble were kind of like the two things that made us call the band that. Mm-hmm. At the time, we were you know really into Slayer and Metallica and Exciter, GBH. Um, you know, we were kind of like into metal and just starting into getting into punk and hardcore stuff. Uh, my exposure to um, hardcore music came through the British stuff that just had a little bit more of a metallic sound to it, like Discharge and GBH. That was my gateway into uh, into other punk stuff. But uh, we were also, I think we have even had like a Maiden cover. I think we did the song Iron Maiden in our set in those early days, playing in front of hardcore kids and like playing the song Iron Maiden and stuff like that. So, but we were kind of ramp, you know, amping it up a little bit. And then, you know, our interest in heavy music, uh, especially Matt and I, we just kept getting more and more into the extreme stuff. And the idea was always like, for us, it was always like, well, let's make it more extreme than like, it's cool. Like we're not trying to be better than Slayer because at the time we were like, you can't, you just can't be better than Slayer. You can't be better than Metallica. You can't be better than Motorhead or Venom or whatever. But what we can do is maybe be faster than them or more satanic or our lyrics could be more gory. Something we something to push it a little bit further than what they were doing, you know? So that was the idea. And then, of course, we changed names a couple times and then set it, settled on another name that I got from a, another VHS uh, or actually it was from a horror book that I had the name Repulsion from the great uh, Roman Polanski, uh, great director. So I'm sure you know all about him. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it became like genocide, and then that led into Repulsion. But it, yeah. as you were getting in, into all these you know, heavier, extreme music, in 85, you kind of took a break away from, geno- from genocide and traveled to Florida to meet up with Chuck Schuldner, right? To eventually... Yeah. Yeah, tell me about that experience. Well, it was one of those things where it was just like, you know, like minds and uh, Chuck and I were pen pals already and we were exchanging tapes of our bands. And, uh, you know, every once in a while we'd scrape together a few dollars and make a long distance phone call. And one day I was talking to Chuck on the phone and uh, um, he had told me that, you know, uh, they Rick was leaving the band or they had kicked Rick out or something. And they already didn't have a bass player. Uh, actually, it started that they were just looking for a bass player because I actually, my friend Sean, I kind of like turned him onto the gig at first. And he, it was kind of terrible. We were young kids, but he started selling his stuff off, you know, and like he was preparing to move down there. And then Chuck called me back and he was like, look, man, Rick left the band too. Like, you know, what if you and, and uh, Matt came down? And it was just like, you know, it was one of those things where, I felt terrible, like disappointing my friend, but at the same time, it just, it was kind of like destiny, you know, like Matt and I, it was like, we're supposed to do this, you know? So we went down there and, you know, just things didn't work out uh, musically between us and Chuck, a lot largely because of logistics. Um, But man, what a different, you know, scenario it would have been had like Cam stuck around and we, we had like recorded an album with that lineup of like Matt, myself, Chuck and Cam uh, would have been interesting uh, to say the least. But, you know, in, in, instead, you know, we got down there and shortly after Cam decided he didn't want to play drums. He wanted to front his own band. So, you know, <clears throat> you ended up with Massacre, Death and Repulsion out of all that. So, um, Other than some like rehearsal tapes that were circulating around, were there any actual recordings made? No, not at all. We never had a chance. I mean, we we rehearsed with uh, Cam for a few weeks, and then he split, and <laughs> we went through a really hilarious audition process where we were we just basically auditioned any drummer that would show up, uh, regardless of their musical background. So it was like teenage girls and forty year old men. You know, mind you, we were like eighteen, nineteen, seventeen at the time. We were, we're like, you know, auditioning like 40 year old guys that grew up on, you know, Judas Priest and Aerosmith and uh, had no idea what we were trying to do, you know, and no one that came by at that time. It, 
uh, ironically, you know, there was six months or seven months later, there was a huge death metal scene that blew up out of like the Tampa area, but we had no idea about these other people in Tampa. You know, we didn't, we weren't in Tampa, we were in Orlando and it just, we couldn't find a drummer, you know, even Chuck had to like split out to San Francisco to, you know, find a drummer. So all of those struggles just led to Matt and I, you know, packing our bags and going back home where we kind of figured, well, at least we can, we know a couple drummers we could jam with until we find um, the right person. And, uh, you know, it also musically, it was a little, a little different, you know, Chuck, had already started to show um, tendencies towards um, like more technical kind of songwriting stuff. And we were more into like the primitive, uh, you know, we loved Hellhammer and Venom and uh, Sodom. And uh, while, while, while I was in Florida, a huge epiphany occurred to me when I heard the band uh, Slaughter from Toronto. And they, to me, combined all the bands that I just mentioned with like some really reckless, like punk speed. And uh, that was kind of like it. I, as soon as I heard Slaughter, I just wanted to be like Slaughter. So you came back to Flint, reformed genocide. How did things go from there? Uh, they went like really fast, actually, because we were so determined that, you know, we felt like we had not really wasted time playing with Chuck because it was a learning experience and um, you know, it was great. It was a good bonding experience for Matt and I, and it was also a good learning experience uh, because one thing I will say about Chuck that um, uh, really impressed me is that he had a very serious drive. Like I'm, you've probably met him and like the guy was like so determined to do what he did and put so much conviction and so much dedication into it that to me, I was like, okay, this is what it takes, you know? So when we came back to Flint, uh, we were very determined to put a band together and we weren't going to fuck around with, you know, like, you know, people that uh, were time wasters or like had better things to do than be in the band. It was like only about the band. And we like skipped all the parties and everything to like sit in a room with each other, just like staring each other down, like waiting for the riffs to come out. Mm -hmm. And that's how we spent all of our free time. And that's how we managed to, you know, between, you know, September of 85, when we returned to Flint uh, in January, Jan uh, excuse me, in January, we, we recorded like a 16 song demo, you know, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, a few months later, we had dropped some of those songs and recorded another 18 song album. So we were writing like crazy. You know, we, we came up with basically like 18 what we considered album worthy songs between like September and May. And that was the intense uh, period of writing and creativity and repulsion. And after that, it just really kind of fizzled out. How would you describe the band's style at that point? Um, our style was you know, it was definitely death metal to me, but it was, you know, we probably called it, we, we used to just joke, like, you know, when people would ask us what our, what genre we fit into, and we would say things like morbid comedy core or whatever, you know, because we like to put a lot of like, you know, all of our lyrics had quite a bit of a, a sense of humor to them. But really, we were kind of like a death metal band that just, we didn't take ourselves as seriously as a lot of death metal bands, um, aside from the music part of it, obviously, and the conviction, but like, as far as conceptually, we didn't take it that seriously. Um, rather than being influenced just by horror movies, uh, we were influenced a lot by um, horror comic books, which always had like a really dark sense of humor to them, you know, dating all the way back to the 50s. So we that, that kind of stuff influenced my write, my songwriting uh, lyrically and stuff. So, yeah, we were death metal, but we were definitely listening to a lot of punk rock, the accused and discharge and uh agnostic front and dri and you know all the british stuff that was you know around and and even like all the you know swedish and the scandinavian bands that were coming out that pushead was turning everybody on to and maximum rock and roll and stuff like that crude ss and um you know all that uh, that sort of stuff and inferno from germany all, all that sort of music was like really like a huge influence you know and even just demo tapes that we were getting you know? 
were people on board with what you were doing musically at that time? Uh, not really. I mean, there were some hardcore like pen pal fans, you know, like a couple of like Shane from Napalm Death was an early supporter. Trey uh, from Morbid Angel. Um, I got a you know a couple letters from him. He was really into the demos. Uh, as far as musicians, you know, that those guys were probably the main ones that like actually got it. Um, there were a few other people, but like the labels that were everyone that we sent the the tapes to. Um, they either didn't respond or when they did they just weren't interested mm -hmm. i just think it was a little too crude and a little too spastic and and hard you know fast for for the labels you know you got to the labels at that time were like even though they were signing death metal bands they were still kind of conservative you know it took them the death should have had a record deal in 85 you know and death didn't get a didn't put a record out until 87 you know because the labels were like hemming and hawing about like, oh, or, you know, is this too much? Is it, you know, they just, I don't know, maybe they were a little bit scared of that type of music or they just didn't know what to do with it. But like, you know, Slayer was the heaviest and hardest band, uh, you know, as far as metal goes, that were signed to a label until, you know, like Possessed and, and Death came around. It was like nobody would go any beyond that you know no none, none of the labels were willing to go beyond slayer as far as extremity mm -hmm. until you know death came out and then of course you know right around that same time earache popped up and earache was the one label that was willing to you know take a chance on these on that next level of, of extremity and they cashed in on it because they signed everyone there were there were no other bands left to sign after they got done you know, they scooped up all of the super extreme bands. And, uh, yeah, they were pretty much all on Earache. So, you know, that's how it went back then. But, yeah, it was it was tough going for us because, you know, we had our local following, but those people were more of just our friends, you know, and they were really open-minded people because they, they lived in Flint and it was like, you know, everyone appreciated live music there. So, like, um, you know, they would they would – keep an open mind for everything for instance you know several years ago i, I ran into uh i went to see saint vitus and i was talking to scott Riegers about the time that they opened for black flag in flint and his face just lit up you know and he was like oh that was like one of the only cities where uh you know people actually liked us <laughs> and it was i'm like yeah you know that i could see why because you know people in flint were like oh you know they're heavy you know cool this is they would just watch a band and take it for what it was and not be worried about, oh, they're too slow, they don't play fast enough, or their hair's too long, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just like people were open-minded uh, because, not, not to say they were more advanced, it was just like they were more appreciative of what, what they were being um, offered, you know. Um, at what point did you actually officially become known as Repulsion? Around May of 86, um, and that was... Um, you know, because we kind of got like a cease and desist letters from the um, uh, the New Jersey genocide, which was um, which is funny because uh, after I moved to L.A., I started playing in a hard rock band called the Super Bees. And the guy that was responsible for um, the label that signed us and put our record out, um, he was friends with those guys. And, and he um, actually talked them into signing us or like you know kept goading them into sign signing us and he was the bassist in the new jersey genocide his name is uh, robert sexton he's a friend of mine i see him all the time in los angeles to this day but then uh also the Jer the japanese band genocide also sent us a letter you know saying that the name was theirs uh and so that was enough for me i was never in love with the name anyway uh first of all it you know obviously has some ugly connotations to it that i was too naive to really understand when i was a kid and second of all uh it seemed a bit generic because it was the name of a judas priest song and you know if we if we look at the back of like unleashed in the east pretty much every song title <laughs> on the record ended up being a band name and so uh you know i was eager to like or i was very um happy to like shed that name when the opportunity came and I had recently written the song Repulsion, and uh, I liked the word. I liked, I had already kind of made a logo for it and everything, and I just hadn't really sprung it on the band yet. 
But when those letters came in, I just went to the band one day and I said, look, we're going to change the name here. I got a logo already made up for it and we were ready to go. And it was because of, you know, the, the Polanski film, which I hadn't even seen at that time. I just had a, a horror book that had a still from it of, of Catherine Deneuve where the hands are coming through the walls. And I, I, I was like, this is such a cool image. And the name of the movie was so cool. I just liked the way the word, you know, one, one of the things that I always look for is like, write the word down on paper and how does it look? And the word repulsion just looked good written down. So that was it. That was the name change. Uh, the band broke up at what, 1988? How come? Uh, well, we actually sort of, we never really ever completely officially <laughs> broke up. But in uh, July of 86, um, Aaron, our second guitarist, um, who had been playing with us for about six months, uh, he had a son uh, born that summer. And uh, Dave, our drummer, just sort of lost interest. And uh, we started jamming with a different uh, drummer that summer a guy named Tom Puro, who was a friend of ours. And uh, so it was just Matt and Tom and I, um, you know, D um, Aaron was busy with, um, you know, the newborn baby. Dave was out of the picture. So we just sort of like uh, didn't really, that drummer just didn't really have the same sort of speed as Dave. And like the, you know, it wasn't the same. It just, the vibe wasn't there. So we just sort of like fell apart and kind of drifted around. and then. Every once in a while, we would play a show, but we never really worked on any music or anything. It was just like, hey, everybody's in town, you know, let, let's let's put on a gig. So we did that for a little while. You know, I think the last one of those was probably in like January of 88 or something like that. And then uh, a couple of years or a year or so later, when, when the record finally got issued, the, the record, which was recorded in June of 86 and released sometime in 80, 89 on earache i can't even remember what month it was but the record came out in 89 on earache and of course at that time you know we got a lot of press because it was on earache uh, or an offshoot of earache and all those bands were were getting a lot of press at that time and, and talking about a record and so we had a lot of attention a lot of people asking us if we'd play and so we started you know playing again around that time uh, but Matt was in the army, so it was kind of inconvenient, uh, but we always wanted him to play. So, um, you know, we just told him when you get out, uh, let's, let's keep doing this. In the meantime, Aaron and I had written a handful of songs, you know, when Matt was home, uh, we would, him and I would get together and write, but then I, I never really felt that that material that we were doing at that time really was up to snuff. It was, some of it was okay, but it just didn't really have the spirit and I wasn't really that inspired. And uh, and it was around that time that I just decided that I was going to move to Chicago, and that that sort of effectively put a, put the band to rest for for quite a while. All of it. Um, were you surprised how horrified was received? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the the people that you know, the there was a slow build up towards the towards that as the as we broke up. You know, that was like weird because. You know, when you when your band breaks up and you haven't released anything, you kind of think to yourself, like, well, there it goes. You know, we put all that work into it and um, it's just going to fade into obscurity and it'll be completely forgotten to the, you know, to the sands of time. And then, you know, all of a sudden one day I was at work and uh, this was the most surprising thing of all. I was working at a record store and a box of imports came in and the guy that I was working with uh, was, was going through the imports and he pulled out the Napalm Death Scum record and he was like, this looks pretty wild. And it was, you know, it was because it was an import, it wasn't sealed. Uh, so we put it on the turntable uh, in the record shop and we listened to the first side and I was like, oh, you know, this is cool, you know, like, uh, you know, hardcore, very fucking fast hardcore reminded me of, you know, the puss head, you know, uh, the stuff that he was always, you know, sort of uh, championing. And then we flipped the record over and on the beginning of side two, there's the song, I think it's called Deceiver that has like, they open with the opening riff of Stench of Burning Death. And my first thought was like, what a weird coincidence that they came up with the same exact riff that I did. And then, uh, and then it just dawned on me like, wait a minute, that doesn't happen. Not, not that 
exact, you know, and I ran over and I was started looking at the cover and I saw like all they're wearing homemade repulsion hats, repulsion shirts, and like they thanked repulsion. Repulsion's name is mentioned multiple times in the thanks list. And there's even a photo of me on the collage on the inner sleeve. I was just kind of like in shock. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it wasn't long after that, that, uh, that you know we started corresponding with those bands and um and next thing you know we were you know getting an offer from earache to put the album on mm -hmm. did all of this inspire you to kind of get going again yeah exactly i mean it was like um you know we still loved that stuff and you know we were very proud of what we did with it so when the opportunity came to sort of like you know put the band back together and uh, you know i asked everybody and everybody was into it including matt who like i said was in the army at the time but you know everybody was sort of like yeah you know let's give it a give it a whirl you know so we started playing and again playing out again and what now we played some cool shows met a lot of cool people but like i said uh, aside from one or two songs i didn't feel like we were writing really strongly at that point um so it just kind of fell apart. And I think your last kind of official release would be that EP here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that has two of the better songs that we wrote on it. Um, but, you know, we we were kind of like uh, Dave didn't really love playing the blast beats. And um, so we kind of decided that we would just stay very extreme, but sort of like move away from the blast beats. and. It really wasn't wasn't really our style, you know. We started incorporating them back in eventually, and uh, you know, but we didn't really get the songwriting was we were all a little astray, you know. We kind of like maybe we're kind of like being a little too influenced by the bands that we influenced, you know, and uh, and we weren't really carving our own path at that point. And um, I feel like it was just like uninspired songwriting. Mm -hmm. and um you know there's some of those songs are available on that on that cd that you're holding i think there's a probably six or five or six songs from that those writing sessions that are that were demoed up in very crude form and offered on that cd and and you could tell you know the songwriting is just not quite there mm -hmm. um so once repulsion kind of calls it a day in 93 um you didn't stop you moved to chicago and ended up in cathedral tell me about that yeah, I, I mean, I shortly after I moved to Chicago, uh, I I had a friend in Detroit who was um, really encouraging me to answer the call when Cathedral was advertising for a bass player in the Foundations magazine, and uh, I just kept thinking like, ah, they, I'm sure they found somebody like the minute they put the ad out. You know, I couldn't. They were such a great band to me at that time. I couldn't imagine that they would be like struggling to find a bass player at that time but apparently they they hadn't found the right person so when i called you know the slot was still available so um i hooked up with those guys and and started playing with them like just you know months after i'd moved to chicago i didn't even really have very many friends there yet so um i kind of like was off touring with them all over the place and um didn't really make any friends in chicago until i got done uh touring with cathedral I had a couple friends, you know, especially the guys in Wicker Man, mm -hmm. um, you know, were friends of mine and uh, John Almonte, I knew, and I knew you from previously from when uh, the first time I met you the first time, I believe, Repulsion played. That's right. In Chicago at Foch's. Foch's. <laughs> yeah, which I believe was with Deceased and uh, I can't remember if Macabre were on that show or not. It may be a very, very young Broken Hope, something like Possibly, that. Possibly, yeah. And and then there was a follow-up in... in was it Flint or, or Detroit, the Metal Mom Festival? That's whatever. right. Yeah, yeah, the, the Michigan Death Fest, yeah. That was quite interesting. Um, yeah. So after Cathedral, you somewhat ended up in, in California down the line. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, after Cathedral, I started playing in you know, like a power pop sort of, a, um, you know, pop band in Chicago called the Hush Drops, mm -hmm. which I met through Dave Horniak, who's putting on the... Um, putting on the heavy Chicago fest with Sean. Um, I went out with Dave and John San Juan from Hush Drops one night. And you know, John mentioned that they were looking for a bass player. And I just <laughs> ended up playing with them for a couple of years. And uh, I was out of my league a little bit. You know, those guys were like amazing songwriters and great vocalists. And uh, I learned a lot playing with them. But 
you know, eventually I ended up out here and I kind of thought like I wasn't going to be in any bands in anymore. Then I hooked up with this rock and roll band, the Super Bees, and we ended up making records and touring and stuff. So I never really got that out of my blood. And um, it was around 2004 that uh, that that CD relapse reissued our record, re reissued Horrified on CD with all the extra stuff. And we kind of like gathered up everything we could and had some really good liner notes written up by our friend Laurent mm -hmm. and uh, figured, OK, this will be the definitive release we won't ever have to reissue this because it's going to have all the demos and all the cool you know rarities and everything included on it so um we put that out and then uh when we did that relapse asked us if they minded or if we minded if they put us on their booking roster because they were booking in-house at the time so we mm -hmm. just kind of laughed and said yeah sure <laughs> nothing will come of it but what the hell and then next thing you know, old Jack from the Milwaukee Metal Fest uh, came up with a really good offer. We ended up playing at Milwaukee Metal Fest, and uh, we really haven't stopped since. Mm -hmm. Now, that was, I think, 03 or 04 or something like that. Like, yeah, 03, maybe so. Um, yeah, about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago. Um, and um, we've only been back to the Midwest once, and maybe... 2004 we played in flint or something like that so yeah been a very long time since it's hard, hard to believe that that much time goes by so you this know. reunion was kind of like an accidental reunion yeah yeah it was and but it never really stopped because you know matt and i both live in la now and uh you know at one point i think dave and aaron like uh they were sort of apprehensive about going to europe uh and um, Matt and I were like, you know, there's no way we're not going to go to Europe, you know. So we just said, you know, well, whether we have to find a new drummer or not, we're going to Europe. You know, we've never been with this band. It's time. Um, you know, this is a rare opportunity. So we started doing shows in Europe with uh, Matt Harvey and Cole Jones from Exhumed and Cretan. And, uh, and then... You know, eventually Matt, you know, found his way out of the band just because he was busy or, or at one point I think he was going to stop playing music and he moved to Florida. And of course, we see how many bands he's in now. So he never really stopped playing music. And then Cole, um, you know, started having uh, he's you know, he had a kid and started raising his family. And uh, and then we ended up getting uh, Chris Moore from uh, Magruder Grind and Coke Bust on drums. And uh, he's been with us ever since. And I, I kind of feel like we're stronger than ever, you know, like as far as musically goes. I mean, um, you know, I hope to prove that to you guys in a couple of weeks that we're like better live probably than we've ever been in our whole career, you know. At this point, any chance of creating any new music? You know, the possibility is always there. We, we have lots of, you know, ideas that we kick around and, um, uh, I think maybe right now, you know, the possibility is probably greater than ever. I, I can't say that there would be ever be like a, a full length album. I, I feel like, you know, albums are almost like pointless in, in this day and age. Like, uh, unless you're a really big band, um, I think you could just make music and put it out there without really having to, you know, accumulate a body of work. That's not to say anything will come out, but uh you know, it's very possible, you know, I definitely have been getting more and more into writing again lately. And some of the stuff that I write is definitely, you know, could, could be repulsion. So on. Matt always has ideas for that type of music. I think he, he even released a record uh, several years ago um, that was very grindcore oriented. So yeah, we could, we could, you know, the possibilities there, but uh, it's not a, it's not a guarantee, but it's definitely in the realm of possibility. So, Horrified came out quite a few times. What do you think keeps this album so popular? You know, I've, I've thought about this a lot over the years, and I think part of it is that it was, you know, one of the first of records of its kind, one of the first things people heard um, that had that much speed and that much noise and extremity to it all at one time. As well as the fact that it's, you know, it's kind of like a lo-fi recording, um, which doesn't place it in like, you can't go, oh, that's the Randy 
Burns sound or the Scott Burns sound, Mora sound, or the Swedish sound or whatever. It doesn't sound like it came out in the 90s or the 80s or whatever. It just, it has a little bit of a, I don't want to sound like egotistical or anything, but it has, it's sort of got a timeless sound to it because of the fact that it is so, it was so extreme for its time and yet also so sort of primitive and uh, crude in the recording style that it, it's kind of garagey in a way, you know, so it's, I think it just sort of stands up. It's got a little bit of rock and roll, a little bit of punk, um, you know, it's metal without being too, you know, it's not melodic or anything. So it just, I just don't think it's dated that much, you know, it hasn't, hasn't aged that much. So it, um, it, uh, it holds up well against, um, you know, what people are doing nowadays, as far as, you know, extreme music goes, obviously, you know, with the way records can be produced now with all this, like, you know, the, the crazy extremity you can put on the drums and the recording techniques and everything, you can certainly make music that's way more brutal, but, uh, I just don't think it's really been surpassed as, as far as just the extreme part of it, the, the sort of energy level. Absolutely true. So, yeah, so it holds up for that reason. A lot of the re a lot of the records from that era, you know, like uh, the early death metal stuff, Entombed, and you know, early Possessed, and early Death and stuff. It all it all has that same quality to it that uh, you know that it just holds up well. You see bands from that era, GBH, and <clears throat> um, all the thrash bands that came out from them. They're still going, you know, and people are still into it. Creator. Uh, Sodom, etc. You know, all these bands are they're still around because they have you know sort of stuck to their guns uh, as far as you know not not expanding their sound out too far to to alienate the audience and and you know I think people dig that sort of simple approach. Mm -hmm. What about this cover? It kind of became iconic. Who came up with this concept? <laughs> the concept, uh, you know, was sort of you know jacked from an old comic book i was just you know it never really was meant to be anything more than a sticker actually you know so i was thumbing through some horror comic books and i saw a skull that looked extremely similar to that one and uh i was drawing um the first ever repulsion logo the first time i drew a logo for repulsion i put that skull underneath of it in the in the exact form that it is on the record cover uh, the only difference being that it was painted and the version that you see on the album cover was actually painted by, uh, by, um, Jeff Walker of carcass. He painted that he doesn't, he doesn't have a credit on the record cover because we actually submitted a completely different record cover. Cause we were sort of naive and thinking that like, Oh, we'll just, you know, put whatever on the cover. And a friend of ours who is not really an art, he's a great graphic artist, but he's not, not a painter and we had him paint a cover for the album cover and it was you know maybe it was a little too primitive and crude for an album cover and the earache um, people certainly thought so so they had jeff take the uh the sticker and he blew it up to album cover size and just painted it with watercolors and oil paints or something and that became the cover we were un completely unaware that they switched the cover until we got the albums and we cut the box open and saw the cover and we were like, Oh shit, they changed the cover art. <laughs> <laughs> so like we had no idea. And, uh, you know, when next time we talked to them on the phone, we were like, Hey, what's up with the cover though? Like, yeah. We just felt that the cover that you turned in was, you know, we felt that, they, that it had to have the skull on it. And we were like, well, we did put it on the back and there was a reason for that, you know, but whatever at this point, um, you know, it's sort of become iconic. I mean, it's insane the amount of people that I meet that have that skull tattooed on their bodies. There's even a guy uh, that has it a back piece, like his entire back is that. And it just blows my mind. So, um, you know, I guess they made the right call in changing the artwork to that. And, um, you know, all in all, I think Jeff did a good job, uh, you know, salvaging, you know, what, what, you know the album cover. Uh, at the last minute, the way he did, and I'm grateful to him for it. Oh, you have a trademark at this point. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. Um, finally, looks like we've covered pretty much 40 years of your life being mm -hmm. involved in music, 39, 40. Um, how long more do you think you're going to be involved in music? 
you know, I probably forever at this point, I, I feel like, because I just um, started working on a couple of new projects with some friends and, uh, you know, it's, it's exciting. Um, and, and so they're not at the point yet where I can talk about them, but you know, it's fun. I'm having fun playing music and, um, yeah, I just don't see any end in sight. Excellent. Way to go. Be a lifer. Thank I you have so a day job, so so that allows me to, you know, spend a little money on my Pro Tools setup and buy a piece of gear here and there. So, yeah, I've never made enough money off of music to live on. So, uh, in a way, you know, if you're not going to make a lot of money playing music, I sort of, you know, where you can be comfortable, then I sort of count that as a blessing because I've, you know, maintained my work ethic and, um, and uh, still managed to have a lot of fun, miraculously, playing music and traveling all over the world. So, it's been great. Fantastic. Thank you so much for speaking to me. And I'm looking forward to see you in Chicago. Yeah, um, looking forward to seeing you in person. I'll see you there. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Mark.